This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again. It's the Human Action Podcast, where we are not afraid of books and reading books and talking about books and promoting books. And we have a special episode today in which we do just that. We're very pleased to be joined by Jeff Booth. Uh, Jeff is someone with whom I'm fortunate to be connected to via my good friend Stefan Levera in the Bitcoin uh, air end of things. And Mr. Booth is the, pri- is the author of The Price of Tomorrow, Why Deflation is the Key to an Abundant Future, which came out earlier this year in 2020. And Jeff, I have to guess that when you were writing this book and it came out early, earlier this year, that seems like a lifetime ago now with COVID. <laughs> yeah, it, it certainly is. And then a lot of the predictions in it uh, obviously ended up coming true. But yeah, yeah a lifetime ago. <laughs> well, as we get into some of these predictions, do, does anything about COVID and government responses to it strengthen or challenge the central tenets of the book? No, they only they only accelerate it. Or maybe so so strengthen it by accelerating what's what's happening already with technology by a number of years. So so just accelerating the response to that from central governments, central banks. Let me make a couple of quick comments and get your takes on those. First of all, because I'm sort of in the fin twit financial Twitter and econ world. Uh, and you come from the tech and entrepreneurial world, your, your name was perhaps not instantly familiar to me even six months ago. So I think that's in many ways a good thing because of the way, because the result of that is this book, from my perspective anyway, is completely free of jargon. It's free of politics. It's free of ideology. It's, it feels like a very applied book. I, I really appreciate that, Jeff. I, I, I tried to write it in a balanced approach. I tried to say, I, I tried to look at first principles: what is true, what is not true. Um, and instead of, I, I, I completely understand why there's so many sides and divisiveness in politics today. Uh, today, what's that, what's happening to society? But I tried to look at it from a first principles: why is that happening, rather than rather than sit on top of a system. When you went to your publisher, what did they think about having deflation on the cover? That's a bit of a boogeyman. <laughs> yeah, no, no kidding. I just um, I wanted to think about what an entrepreneur does. They, um, and if they're right, uh, what an entrepreneur does is looks out at the world and says, "Why does this work like this?" and um, and tries to build a better way, better mousetrap, better. And so, most entrepreneurs have a view on the world, um, and they try to build to that. I couldn't see um, after I got through this, and the more I dug, what kind of went down the rabbit hole, the more I realized this might be the only solution, and nobody's talking about it. Uh, nobody, there is just devoid of conversation. Uh, um, the people are talking about how inflation is a good thing, and without questioning the root of that. And so, uh, so uh, they, uh, you, you're right. Publisher said, "Why don't?" Put deflation on the title, but I said, uh, I'm going to go up against status quo and do it anyways. Well, it's not just that inflation is a good thing in the minds of many people. It's actually the express policy of the central bank in Canada and the United States, Exactly, as a matter of fact. Um, exactly. And supposedly Bernanke is going to talk about that tomorrow, Thursday. We're recording this on Wednesday. Supposedly he's going to talk about that in Jackson Hole, Wyoming tomorrow and say that maybe a range of inflation from 0 to 4% or something is going to be acceptable to the Fed rather than some sort of 2% target. So they might look at the average over a, a longer period. And that, that suggests to me that they are perhaps setting us up to be a little more comfortable psychologically with some actual price inflation. Yeah, and, 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 and you're deep in this. You know this. I don't think most people do, though. Um, the the Inflation is just a hidden tax, but it's a hidden tax on the, on the population that's most unable to pay that hidden tax. And so, so as you as you concentrate wealth from that hidden tax, so it's it, some profit, few profit, many others are hurt. And as you concentrate wealth from from that, you uh, you get divisive politics, and you get a rise of socialism, and all of the things that are predictably happening today, which will get worse. Um, as you know, kind of articulated in the book, um, tech, uh, government central banks have no way of stopping what's happening, it, what's going to unfold, short of eventually destroying their currencies through hyperinflation, 
And then after that, you'll get inflation again because, because technology wants to make prices cheaper um, and it wants to do it exponentially so. Um, and and any, any stop of that is uh, through inflation is just kind of filling a hole that will never be – it's just wealth concentration. So, so in the end, technology is a, is a much stronger force than, than government's ability to stop it. Uh, and, and so, so you're going to see, you're going to see this, unfortunately, play out. And it's not going to look, it's not going to look pretty for societies over the next 10 years because, um, because we're already past the point of rescue. Because governments and central banks are jealous mistresses and they'll fight it? Well, they, they have to now. Right. So, so and I do, they don't have to now, but, but if you, if you let deflation take hold, you have a, you, you have a multi-year, you have a depression that makes uh, the thirties look like a cakewalk hmm. because the problem is so much bigger today than the thirties. And so, so, so short of, and here's the irony of the whole thing. The thing they hate the most, the thing they're trying to stop the most, they're empowering. When you have a when you have a policy designed to penalize savings, do you think any CEO in the right mind is going to hold to cash on the balance sheet? Mm-hmm. Right. So so if you have a blip, then they're forced to bail out those same things. So you have you, you, you and do you think why do you think house prices rise? Why do rents rise along with those house prices? Because you have a policy designed to penalize saving savings. Um, and so what does it do? It encourages more debt, more leverage, and makes the fr- uh, system ever, uh, ever more fragile. And, and the system is ever more fragile today. Um, and t- combined with technology wanting to make everything cheaper. So, so y- as you print more, it's just racing into technology companies' valuations. It's just a, it's like a direct pipeline to be able to, because those technology companies are removing jobs. They're doing more with less. Why do we use technology in the first place to do more with less? There's no CEO that says, Hey, I, I'm going to take technology. I'm going to use, drive a whole bunch of technology into my business. So I make my costs go up. Mm -hmm. Right. Point of it is it's deflationary. Um, And it's just, it's, it's deflationary at a rate that, uh, our policymakers have never seen before. It's a structural change mm-hmm. uh, to uh, to the way the world has worked. So they can't. They, they, there's no way they could stop it now, short, short of destroying their currencies, which is the path we're on. Well, I was pleased that your section in the book on AI was optimistic. I mean, there's we all survived software, we all survived the automobile, we all survived horses and then cars and then you know tractors instead of plows, all kinds of things. And I, and I suspect for most of us, let's say our great grandfathers did a long day of, of physical manual labor. So this is a happy thing to be celebrated, not something to be feared. Well, so so that's the point. That is exactly the point. The the, the economics is about well you know this the economics is not about uh, value it's about scarcity right? the air we breathe is free because it's abundant and technology creates almost everything to the point of an abundance so if we embrace technology we would have an abundance of time our most important asset is our time instead of trying to work 50 years to be able to retire for the last uh, for the last 10 or 15 in relative comfort chasing ever higher prices the, uh, of policies that were de- designed to make prices higher. Um, so it, the only, it, here's a better way to say it. The only way that the broad benefits of techno- technology, technological benefits um, get out to a broad section of society are through deflation. Otherwise, every other road is a concentration of wealth, which eventually turns into revolution um, and, and war, if you let it persist. Well, it's interesting because Peter Thiel points out that a lot of things have gotten better with respect to software, with respect to computer science, but some of the more old-fashioned analog world, our planes, our rockets, our cars, haven't sort of kept up with this. And you and I think, well, uh, you know, a DVD player back in 1990 cost 500 bucks or whatever, and now it's 40 bucks at Target if there's, I don't know if DVD players are even available. Um, <laughs> 
But why? It seems like why can't I go get a cool car for three grand? Why is that thirty five thousand? It seems like this has been not uniform. This happy deflation. Yeah,、um, because some of some of the industries haven't been. So think about what is happening to, uh, with Tesla and what will happen for you. Know this because you've read the book. But think about what how many industries that destroys.、Um, people are looking just at the first industry in in cars and everything else. They're not looking at the subsequent change. When、uh, when self driving cars and all the car companies that don't utilization of a car is six percent、right, capacity utilization. So the amount of cars that are made in the world changes dramatically when cars drive themselves, and you just don't have to store two cars in your yard or at work all the time. Everything else changes, and and when capacity utilization of a car could go to fifty percent, mo- business models where you derive value from completely change, and so some of these industries are just just changing now or just about to change. The the most of the deflation, most of most of the effect of deflation is in front of us, not behind of、uh, behind us. And you, again, you know,、um, to stop that force, it took a hundred and eighty. This is before. Covid. It took 185 trillion dollars of global debt debt creation to create 46 trillion dollars of global GDP growth to stop that force. So that force is is coming to it's coming to a town near you. It's coming to every industry. It's、uh, it's unstoppable.、Um, and so governments can continue to print money and create debt at the rate at a, at a ever higher rate, but eventually that'll break too. Well, you talk about sort of the polarities in this book of planned economies and, and laissez-faire economies.、Um, so there's an argument in my circles about AI as re- as regards information. Some people say AI is going to give us such good insight into information that that makes central planning more feasible.、Uh, you know, look at Walmart. That's a giant company. It's the size of some countries, and yet they have central planning managers within Walmart. And then other people say, no, no, no. No matter how much information you have. That Walmart manager has skin in the game because it's it's a private company that a you know a bureaucrat, the governor of California, for example, will never have. So, do you have any thoughts on on AI and and government? Oh yeah, the the geopolitical game going on、uh, with AI. So, if you want that to look like that in the U.S., it looks like a lot of what China is doing with their social credit score. Um, and for a deeper dive on that, read my book or or go to look at what's happening. And if you want the government in every single thing you do,、um, then、uh, then then celebrate that. I I do not believe that that is a path. Yeah, it is scary, right? Because all this tech is is presumably available to government. But here's the sort of the cyberpunk dream, and I think your book speaks to this in a sense, which is that we have this this idea that. Technology manages to outpace even the most voracious state,、uh, and there's just the, and as you say, deflation is so inevitable that we we can view them as a nuisance rather than a threat. Is that maybe a hopeful way of looking at it? Yeah, and and what I would say is if if governments didn't have you and some of this stuff I'm talking preaching to the choir, you know, right? If governments didn't have inflation, they would have to tax at the proper rate to provide services, <sighs> right? So, all inflation is a hidden tax on society, right? That that people,、uh, it's more politically feasible to do that, and that you can build more and more government and everything else, and more and more、uh, be, uh, through that transfer of wealth. The、um, what this will force, and probably, I'm going to take you at a tangent here, but but very rarely does a business ever do what they need to do to meet creative destruction. Right, they always try to stop it. Right,、um, so Kodak invented the digital camera. They didn't benefit from it all, even though we have an abundance of photos in our lives today. They couldn't see a business model that was so polar opposite to the way they made money that they capitalized on the invention they created. Right, Facebook did, others did, but they didn't.、Um, and and so、uh, it, Netflix, right, Blockbuster, Blockbuster put candy aisles in their stores. Uh, when digital download speeds were going faster and made their business <laughs> relevant, right?、Yeah. It, we laugh at things like that now, right? And we laugh at things like that. Why would a government be any different, or why would a whole bunch of people in power be any different? So, what they're trying to do through this, the inflationary policies and everything else, and the design, is protect the status quo at all costs. 
the all costs is the political divide that you're saying in society and the societal divide that you're saying um, in, 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 in what, what's happening. And, and today we have things like Bitcoin that it, it are, people are, are choosing that instead. Um, and as more and more people choose Bitcoin, I, I believe, um, and I'm, I'm happy to be wrong here, but as more people choose Bitcoin, just like a new business, typically the change, the change doesn't come from within the status quo. Change is forced upon the status quo from, from the new. And, and, and Bitcoin, because, it, because it's fixed, because it's, uh, because it's deflationary in, in nature, um, for, is a forcing function. But as more people trust that, that medium, I think it forces governments to, to react. We'll see when, but uh, but but it but change comes from with uh, from outside the system typically instead of from within the system. What do you think about big tech companies like Google? So supposedly has something like ninety some percent of worldwide search, or Amazon. You know, speaking just just off the cuff, did they, does that bother you? Do you worry about these companies? So 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 again, the structure that we have today makes them bigger faster because because a network effects now i'd advise all of your uh, listeners to go deep in and understand what networks effects are how how they amplify power in a network and a network uh, the simplest example is is a telephone one person on, on a new uh, on a telephone system is worthless as you add another person the value in increases for the network as you had another person and over time that network is really hard to to beat because it's so so powerful actually u.s currency is a, a network effect for a long time until bitcoin has a network effect that's growing but network effects are 70 percent of the value of all technology companies if you have strong network if you have if i design companies to exploit high high network effects to to build networks and there's a certain way to do that um, the and so, but if you have policies of inflationary policies against that, actually you're making them stronger faster. You're, the the exact same thing you're trying to prevent as a as policy, you're 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 increasing the wealth and the power at a crazy rate. If you didn't do what governments are doing, then more competition would open up, and those kind of companies would take power slow, more slowly. And be forced to 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 share the benefits uh, with uh, broad, more broadly with society. That's what that's what would happen. So, is the linchpin, at least for us anyway, uh, behind all this government money? Is is that why crypto is so important? That's why it's so it's so important because there is no so so why do, why does currency have trust? It's the underlying obligations that you believe that the government will pay pay those obligations. As soon as that starts to erode, um, currencies lose trust, and we've, you see it in other currencies. And we believe that it'll never happen here, but it will happen here as sure as as day turns into night. Well, what I like about your book is there's there's kind of a blurring. Perhaps this is intentional between what we might think of as government policies and technology. In other words, you aren't laying out policy prescriptions. There's no tedium in this book. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people in my world like to think of, of economics, uh, choice, scarcity, exchange, you know, win-win. And we like to think of the state as this big, bad boogeyman and their, their win-lose. Um, and, yeah, and, right? and by the way, and I, and I think, Jeff, that's where I disagree. I don't think, I, I, I don't, I, I think not all. But I think many people, um, and I'd encourage uh, many of the people in your world to think the same way. I don't think these are bad people mm -hmm. across the board. I think these are well-intentioned people caught in a system um, that they can't see their way out of. And they don't even, how many people question, um, we've been so taught that deflation, stop deflation at all costs because it kills, uh, uh, it uh, kills productivity, business, and there's a deflationary spiral. We've been so ingrained to that. Nobody even questions that anymore. All deflation is, is goods and services going down in cost versus your money, right? What, isn't that something that you would want to happen? I know personally it's something I want to happen. So as you go higher and higher into this, um, and so, again, 
it's not bad people just like in, in um in kodak it's not bad people right it's caught in a system trying to keep that system going that is a bad system for today's time there's been a structural change that they are not aware of and that's the structural change in business happens all the time that's what creates the new businesses well you're i believe it's the second to last chapter how we cooperate you mentioned that as we get into greater abundance through deflation, then that sort of minimizes the effect or incentive to cheat. Bingo. People have have more stuff. And so that, that suggests more of a win-win society maybe down the road. Well, that's what I believe will happen if you let this happen. No, no. The transition uh, period, because we keep kicking the can down the road and we make it worse and worse, the transition part of it, period is going to be really ugly, uh, unfortunately. And I don't think there's a way out of an ugly transition period where a lot of people are going to lose their entire wealth and uh, uh, on, on the way through. And um, so that those are hard for societies to bear, right? It's a, it's a um, or worse, revolution and wars. Those are hard for societies to bear and then, the, then a reset of the rules. But, but yeah, if you allow deflation, if you allow the, the the abundance that is clearly there for the first time in human history, we actually have the ability to do that, where we can get off this crazy treadmill, um, and it will get better and better if we allowed that to happen. It does minimize the incentive to cheat. But, uh, and if you look through a lens of game theory, it actually sets up a cooperative n- nature um, on uh, uh, to be able to get to, to a better place. And in the last chapter, The Simple Solution, you even say that we should embrace deflation as the natural order. Well, I thought that was an interesting phrase. Yeah, and, and again, isn't it? right? If, so if, te- if technology is exponentially improving um, and the only thing stopping prices coming down at that same rate is monetary easing, isn't the natural order prices com- coming down? And, and isn't anything stopping that? Um, uh, um, a fight against uh, essentially a fight against gravity. Right? It's, it's not going to, there's no chance that it's going to win. So Jeff Booth declares central banks against the natural order. <laughs> I think that's what's happening here. I mean, because that's what they exist to do is to fight it. It, it, that's what they exist to, to do to fight it, and and, and you're going to see crack, more and more cracks. You're going to see. So if you kind of from here, of course they're going to say we need to increase inflation rate higher. <laughs> of course, by the way, if they just if central banks just keep doing what they're doing, and and kind of ma- kind of manipulate balance sheets, we could say, but but still there's an assumption that that debt has to be paid back through higher taxes, then that is further disinflation. All, all printing money, or all that does right now in current form, is adds to debt, which which it adds it adds higher taxes, it, which dif, dif, which re, reduces business growth, which adds to deflation before the technology. Um, the only way to actually so the next step is they're going to change the rules. Fed is going to change the rule, and there's going to be a direct pipeline from government, and politicians are going to be put in charge of inflation. Hel- I mean, inflation and helicopter money, um, and all hell is going to break loose. That is a high likelihood, a high probability of what happens next on this path, because there's no way that no way out of it. So, how does this knowledge or this perspective help you in in building companies or running companies? Well, so it's just, again, you know this from. Um, I didn't write the book to become a bestseller. Or I didn't care anything about the book. I cared about the book. The book it was really a selfless action to look after my kids and the next generation saying, it's, we, need to, we need to look deeper. Most of my time is focused on company formation, um, helping entrepreneurs get to where they want to get to. Um, and or, so I, yeah, I didn't need to be a, an author. In fact, I was a, I'm a reluctant author. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, the uh, and 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 so, but I think it's such an important message that not it, I, it was like an entrepreneur. You, you look out at the world and you look at this divide, and people aren't putting their finger on it. What's causing it? And it, and it kind of it made me mad. It was something I was talking about for ten years, um, and and almost essentially said, I have to do something about it. 
Well, I have to say, outside of academic economists, and they're mired in academic journals, nobody is saying in the popular space what your book is saying. Nobody. Yeah, I know. And, and, and everybody thinks you can get it. MMT, everything else. It's a free ride. Yeah. There's a lot, of, if you want to talk to Stephanie Kelton's book and MMT, it, it misses such glaring, glaring things that, that, that if you keep on going down that uh, question, okay, it, it does that matter if governments can keep uh, printing money and, and everything else. And then, and, and it makes an important thing that, well, if you have a reserve currency, then it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay, I, I, even if I dis, d- disagree with every, a bunch of the other stuff in the business, and, and, and that alone, if you have a reserve currency, well, you don't have a reserve. Did did uh, did Rome have a reserve currency when they changed their uh, hmm. changed gold to tin? Or <laughs> right, so so reserve currencies change, and as soon as people lose trust in a in a currency, you don't have a reserve currency. So what makes us believe that we have a reserve currency forever? If other countries lose faith in that reserve currency, and so so such clearing things like that, but 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 it's written in a way that would get a whole bunch of people to say, "Oh, there's a free ride here." Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me just finish with this. I loved this book. I just read it this past weekend. It's called "The Price of Tomorrow: Why Deflation Is the Key to an Abundant Future." Jeff Booth is the author. He's got a website called thepriceoftomorrow.com. He's on Twitter, and I think you're just at Jeff Booth, B-O-O-T-H. That's right. And um, again, I'm a little late to the Jeff Booth party, but I I, got to tell you, I I really appreciate you writing this book. I think it's the right length, pace. I think, you know, 600-page tomes are not, are are very, you know, from a cost-benefit analysis, not a good thing necessarily. And I really recommend it. I I suggest people hop on Amazon and get it. So I want to thank you for your time today. Thanks very much. It was my pleasure. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org. Mises.org.